day, everyone, and welcome to PDN's Convos with the Candidates. I'm Nestor Lacanto, joining this edition by Ginger Cruz, who is running for Congress. Ginger, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Although, I tell you, when you started, I almost felt like saying it. I'm Ginger Cruz, and welcome to the <laughs> evening news. <laughs> We've kind of done this before, yeah. We have. <laughs> uh, for those infinite amount of people, <laughs> tiny amount of people who don't know who you are, please introduce yourself to the to the folks. Absolutely. So, Ginger Cruz... Um, Grew up in Guam, Harmon Loop Elementary School. I was a o girl, Poutine Court in Liguan Terrace. And then I went to St. Anthony's, and I went to Academy. And I got to say a shout-out to so many of my classmates who've been part of our campaign. It's been kind of incredible. We were together last night for Halloween, handing out candy to kids and reminiscing about junior high. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I worked under both the ADA and Guterres administrations. Um, spent a lot of time with former Governor Carl Gutierrez, uh, working on so many things, bringing down long distance rates, really expanding the tourism on Guam, getting really involved in local policy. And then I left Guam in 1999, the very tail end, to go to the States to get my master's degree and to get more experience. And then in 2001, 9-11 happened. And I knew I had to be a part of that response. And so within you know a couple of months of that, Um, I was working for the Deputy Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, and for eight years, it was sort of a detour, but that was definitely a passion project where I got to work on the biggest national security issue, um, which was defending the United States from terrorism. So did that, spent two years on the ground in Iraq as a civilian, um, and worked in Washington, D.C. at the time with the Congress, with the Senate, with the House of Representatives, and the Secretaries of State and Defense. So that was incredible. Then um, finished that work because that was a temporary office. So once it was done, it folded up after Iraq Reconstruction concluded. Um, and I was very fortunate to form a company, a consulting firm, which works in the defense business. And primarily what we do is we raise the amount of local content that the prime contractors use when they're performing defense contracts. So like in Guam, it's really helping companies connect to local companies, hire local people, and get as much Guam content into those federal programs as we can. Uh, Came back to Guam in 2019 and was uh, working in my company, and then I taught at University of Guam, taught U.S. foreign policy, And then at the very beginning of this year, I said to myself as I was teaching it that there's a lot more that I felt could be done in Washington, and I threw my hat in the ring, and here I am. And here you are. (laughs) (laughs) So what we've been doing with the convos with the candidates is giving the candidates an opportunity to talk about what their plans are should they be elected. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for you, maybe you could give us uh, three of your top um, issues that you would address Mm -hmm. should you make it into Congress and what you would do in the first 100 days to try to help achieve that? So there's a lot to do. There, There is a window of time where I believe that the federal government is really elevating Guam in the federal system. We all know that we're the tip of the spear, but it's more than that. We are in such a critical moment where the Indo-Pacific is really the focus of not just the United States, but the world's attention. And we have this wonderful opportunity to be able to make the case to change policies so that we can do things better on Guam and to make sure that we fix any unintended consequences from the military buildup. The military buildup is fantastic and it's done great things for the island, but the unintended consequences on housing and so many other things is something we need to to manage. So my three priorities. My first priority is health care because without a healthcare system on our island that can fully support all of the people. And this includes military contractors, but most especially the people of Guam. We need to have a healthcare system that works. We need to be able to provide the basic support to people. Um, and it affects every single person on island. So one of the first things I would do is get somebody on board who is an expert in healthcare policy. I've been talking to some people in DC already and put together an agenda that might take, you know, two years, it might take a little bit longer, I might have to work with, you know, a lot of different options, I definitely am going to include people on Guam, but we need to come together with an agenda, 
and work on it. And it includes everything from removing the cap on Medicaid, why hasn't it been done so far, we need to dig into that and really get to it, um, SSI for the people of Guam, getting the reimbursement rates for the hospital brought from 2014 up to 2025. Um, and so many other portions that, you know, child care, elder care, really have a comprehensive health care plan. The second piece is the security of Guam. And the Department of Defense is doing an amazing job of ensuring that Guam is secure, there's a missile defense system, and all of those pieces are in place. What we need to do for the people of Guam is ensure that we are prepared because in the event of any contingency, a man-made contingency, it doesn't even have to be an attack from another party. It could be an accident. There could be something that happens at the port. There, it, any myriad of things could happen to us. We need to be better prepared. And I really would focus on engaging in discussions at the federal level and in Congress to increase support for civil defense, for Homeland Security and for the Guam National Guard. Those are the three parts of our local government that are receiving normal levels of support, pretty much the same as any other community. And I'm sorry, we are not Nebraska. We are not, you know, Wisconsin. This is the most challenged area of international tension, and we have to be prepared. And we need more resources so our National Guard is properly resourced and Homeland Security and Civil Defense. And then the third, of course, while I'm doing that is the economy. We have to strengthen tourism. Not a lot's been done in the last two years, and I think that's a travesty because the federal government has resources at the Department of Commerce, so we've got to get that engaged, and we've got to get tourism strengthened and find a way to get that back and what re federal resources we can get to the government of Guam to help that happen. And then at the same time, we absolutely have to diversify. Why we haven't taken steps to get the ship repair facility back on Guam, to me, was like the one thing that was so obvious. The Coast Guard needs its ships repaired. The Navy needs its ships repaired. We had a thriving ship repair facility on Guam with 2,500 great jobs. There's tech jobs there. There's skilled jobs. It pays really well. And then there's all the industries that go along with it. So we've got to bring that back. We've got to bolster the additive manufacturing. And I know that the governor's office is working very hard on that. And there's already companies that are looking at doing that. But there have to be more resources so we can speed that up, so we can be able to create more jobs and more opportunities, more subcontracting opportunities, so we can all be engaged in that economic belt that surrounds the Defense Department, defense-adjacent type of work. Um, and then the third part, really, of that economic stool is broadband. There's a $150 million grant that Guam got to expand mm -hmm. broadband, and I know they're putting that to really good use, but it's more than that. You've got all those undersea cables. They just had a ribbon cutting the other day. There's so mm -hmm. much potential that we have on Guam to have AI centers and data centers. And to do that, we need federal support so we have more workforce development. We need to strengthen our power system so we have the clean power and we put it underground so that a storm doesn't knock it out, so that we can create an environment so that these broadband companies want to set up industries on Guam because that also will have good paying jobs. All right, uh, first question, um, you did mention um, the tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. um, what is your thoughts on um, military-civilian relationship going forward? And do we need to leverage our, you know, our, our being the tip of the spear, how important Guam is uh, to the Indo-Pacific uh, and national defense um, in this region? So being the tip of the spear is a part of the equation. It's the rest of the spear that has to be strong. And I think really early on I talked about, you know, the, the handle of the spear is also what is supporting all of that. And in the case of Guam, you know, the unintended consequences we're seeing from all of this military buildup is, number one, we're poaching from each other to get limited staff. So if you're really good at contracting or if you're, you know, a great teacher or if you're great at security, there's a limited pool of people and you have this competition between jobs on base, which are really paying well, the federal government's hiring people, but then you have all the companies outside the fence, many of whom have contracts inside the fence, and they're training up people and then losing them because they're getting hired. And at the end of the day, we need to work closer together in order to raise the total amount of trained, capable, excellent people that can staff all of these opportunities inside and outside the fence because it's symbiotic, it works together. And I don't think enough focus has gone into that. Housing, huge issue. Mm -hmm. And you know, the thing about housing, people 
complain a lot and there's a lot of round tables, but when you dig into it, the first level tells you where the problems are. There are 3,000 H2 workers, in addition to the ones we have now, who are already approved to come in. And the reason they can't come in is because there's no housing for them, mm -hmm. which is so chicken egg, because you need them to build the housing, but you can't bring them in because you don't have a place to house them. And so these are the types of things that we need to have solutions with the federal government. And what I suggest is the solution is not necessarily here on Guam because you have to have the discussions and the open flow of communications with Guam, but the policy decisions and the budgetary decisions are all made in Washington, D.C. And so in Washington, at the policy shop at the Department of Defense, in the U.S. Congress, this is where we need to work on the funding and the programs that's going to allow us to build more housing, allow us to make the case to get the federal government to do more to build infrastructure, because that's what holds a lot of this back, get federal incentives to build, you know, have investors come in and give federal incentives for that. And there's even one program that the late Senator Ben Pangolinan was looking at a while ago, which is a private sector build out of military housing. And there's a provision of that law which allows you to waterfall it and actually build housing outside the base. I want to revisit that. I want to see what we need to adjust. Is there legislation that we can use to update that law and get that enacted? Because we've got to act fast. Because our people need housing. They're being locked out of the market because of the crush and the influx of people with the military buildup. And we have to solve and that. One of the things that, that we keep hearing is that um, you know the cost of building a house is too, so high that y you can't really build affordable housing right. and, and make it profitable. And how do you address that? So a big part of that is infrastructure. And if we think about it, we're incredibly lucky on Guam because so much of our base infrastructure, even though we've invested a lot of money in it, so much of our base infrastructure was put in by the military, if you think about it. I mean, around the time of the Vietnam War, a lot was invested when all of that military construction was happening. And we've taken those assets, and the government of Guam and all the agencies have kind of maintained that. But it's going to take another huge infusion. To, uh, For example, we need a sewer system over the water lens. I mean, we just do. And it is going to be impossible for us to tell the homeowners to shoulder that cost. It's mm -hmm. an incredibly high cost. And the government of Guam doesn't have that kind of money either. So we've got to figure out a way where if maybe the government of Guam has the land and the federal government can help with the infrastructure and we can incentivize the private sector to come in, like how do we work together to be able to answer those questions? But we're going to need help if we're going to solve that issue. All right. We're going to take a short break. Uh, we'll be back with congressional candidate Ginger Cruz right after this. Don't go away. with uh, PDN's convos with the candidates. Our guest, uh, Ginger Cruz, a congressional candidate. Ginger, next question is, you talked a little bit about um, economic diversification. Mm -hmm. How can you, f if you are elected uh, from Congress, help Guam with what um, everybody agrees needs to happen? We need to diversify our economy. The diversification really needs to fall into those areas where Congress is already funding. So, Additive manufacturing is something that makes so much sense for Guam because it supports defense manufacturing. There's a big move in the U.S. Congress to expand what's called the defense industrial base because the federal government has realized that we've outsourced things for too long. And so where we have a competitive advantage, we're surrounded by the ocean, and we've got all of the different branches of the military operating out of here in the Indo-PACOM region. So that is a wonderful opportunity to diversify our economy, not just for the military. So I'll give you an example. Sea drones. I was actually working on this in my role as an industry leader and working with several companies who are very actively looking at how they can do that work here on Guam. Because not only would sea drones be very useful for the military in all sorts of applications, the research and development capability, the ability to provide affordable ways to get supplies and equipment out to remote islands in the Pacific, all of this can be addressed by sea drones. And while air drones are a more developed industry, sea drones are relatively new. So the University of- water? 
underwater or yep. above water. So, I mean, you've got mm, yep. all sorts of different kinds. And they're actually easier because if you try and fly an air drone from here to a remote island, there's a lot of battery power it takes to get there. And in order to keep it up in the air and it's heavy with the battery, it has a hard time. A sea drone kind of floats on the ocean, so you can just use that battery power to get it where it needs to go. So there's so many uses in the Pacific that could really help with commerce. It could help with getting medicine out to remote islands. It could be used for research and development on climate change, um, undersea uh, mining or mapping, um, protection of the undersea cables. There's so many things. So the University of Guam has a program um, in drones, and they're looking at that, and they're talking to some companies. And I just think if we look at areas like that, the, the whole marine lab at the University of Guam, the interest that so many of our young people have in the ocean, and it blends so nicely with uses that the military would also have. So we need to be creative and diversify in areas where Guam has the competitive advantage or things made on U.S. soil, like you don't want to be making secret drones in a foreign country. So it would make more sense to manufacture them on Guam. So those are the, the areas that I think really need to be looked at. All right. You know, there are some federal issues that um, uh, congressional delegates uh, have been tr trying to address for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, let's see, um, the Jones Act. Mm -hmm. Airline cabotage, mm -hmm. the Guam only visa waiver for the, for the Philippines. Those are those are just three. Right. Um, is, are those issues that you th you think are worthy of um, following up still, even though um, we've been l largely unsuccessful over the years? Or is there something else that you wanted to focus on? What are your thoughts on those three? I don't know that we've been unsuccessful. So first of all. The Jones Act doesn't apply to Guam, right? It's it's a de facto thing. The reason that we're subject to the Jones Act is because anything that comes shipping through Hawaii, which is Jones Act, stays on the same ship. It doesn't make any sense to then, you know, change ships. So that's why. But Guam has ships that also service the island that are not Jones Act because we're not subject to the Jones Act. Um, in my platform on gingercruise.com, I discussed that issue. And I think the opportunity is before us because there is a major rewrite of maritime strategy because the U.S. in general understands that there are opportunities now for hub and spoke capability, transshipment capability, and more of a question of Guam looking to trade with Asia rather than always looking to the mainland, which could help bring down costs for everybody on Guam, for our groceries, for you know the things we need around the house, um, construction materials. There's a lot of things that we could do. So that overall look at the maritime strategy is something that is a priority of mine. On immigration, I have also in my platform a concept that I think is really important. So in the next Congress, I firmly believe that we are going to see the most major rewrite of immigration regulation mm -hmm. in 40 years because this is the top national issue, mm -hmm. right? There's no mm -hmm. way that this Congress is not going to take that up. So it's the perfect opportunity to put in that massive omnibus bill a section which would deal with Guam. And instead of every time it runs out, every five years, we have to rush and put a rider in the NDAA to get the H-2 visa mm -hmm. extended or try to fight for just the Philippine visa waiver, which would make so much sense for tourism. We need to have a comprehensive approach. We need to go to the Immigration and Naturalization Service with a team from Guam that knows what the issues are, sit with them, and in my mind, hammer out a comprehensive, lasting regulation within the immigration regulations that would cover just Guam. Would it, would it be Guam um, in charge of immigration, that, similar to Saipan? Although CNMI had it taken away from them. Yes, yeah. that would be one of the things to be negotiated because I think, I mean, if you look at the H-2s right now, the certification is made by the government of Guam and it works very well. So that would be part of the negotiation. But I believe the first step is really negotiating with the Immigration and Naturalization Service, working out what we could do, what authorities we could have on Guam, what authorities the federal government wanted to maintain, but putting in place something permanent so that instead of always trying to Band-Aid mm -hmm. or fix this or fix that, we have an opportunity. We know that there's going to be a vehicle to do it. If we can have that discussion and do it, I think it would solve things for the long term. I think we'd have a better shot at getting the Philippine visa waiver. And I think we would solve you know, needing doctors or needing professionals. Or there's even a problem getting film crews out to Guam, which mm -hmm. are needed to support our tourism industry. 
put it all in one measure and see if we can negotiate and get an agreement and then whatever act we need to take in Congress to support something that is laid out by the executive branch, yeah. that would be something that I would want to do. You probably have to drag the Department of Defense into that conversation. Absolutely. Too, <laughs> Absolutely. They yeah. would, and, and all of the federal agencies that have a stake in it, I think would certainly be part of an interagency group. Um, but, you know, when I worked for Carl Gutierrez back in the day, we had an interagency group. That was how we got the long distance rates down. And, and that was a major rewrite of federal regulations. So if we're going to do that again, we're going to need to get everybody together. We're going to need the support of the White House, get everybody on the same page. Um, hopefully we could do it within the time period to get it in the bill. If it takes longer, it takes longer. But we've got to start the conversation in order to fix it. Yeah, real quickly, airline cabotage? Uh, cabotage. So I really believe we need to look at open skies. I was interested to see. The State Department came out with an announcement uh, two weeks ago where they were so happy that Angola was granted an open skies, um, you know, declaration, which allowed a lot more airlines to come in and out and lower airfares for Angola. Angola's in Africa. We need that on Guam. Right. So I thought, there you go. State Department, Department of Transportation, there's so many people involved in that. And I've been working on this actually for a couple of years now with Governor Carl Gutierrez over at GBB. And I know the governor's office is very involved, also in the CNMI, same thing, the governor's office there. We need to get together and look broader. We need to look at the open skies concept because not only is it about lowering airfares, it's about improving trade, transportation, and commerce for the whole Pacific area and making Guam that hub. And I think if we do that, we've already got Air Nauru setting up small spokes off of a hub, increasing flights. They're getting us down to Australia now with Palau. If we can encourage that, I think we'll do two things. One, bring down airfares for everybody on Guam. And number two, increase the amount of flight options for people throughout the Pacific, which will increase trade, which will help our economy, and it'll be good for the whole region. Okay, real quickly, um, we don't vote for president, but um, if you are to uh, w win a seat in Congress, you'd have to deal with the new administration. Um, who should be the next president of the United States? And if your person doesn't win, um, how would you deal with the other guy who, if that person would become the next president? So when I decided I was going to run for Congress, and I thought really hard about a non-voting delegate seat in Washington, the beauty of a non-voting delegate seat is you don't have to be hyper-partisan. Part of the problem that you have in Washington is this hardening along the lines. Sometimes if you're a hardcore Republican, you won't listen to a Democrat. If you're a hardcore Democrat, you won't listen to a Republican. And then you lose out, and then you're not able to get things through. So I've taken an approach where I believe that if I am elected to Congress, I am not going to say, who is, I mean, we don't even get a vote anyways. But I don't want to say that because the people need to decide who the president is going to be. And I think the best thing I could do to serve the people of Guam is be able to work with whoever the occupant of the White House is. And I can tell you right now, I have fantastic connections into the Harris Walls administration. I was in the Democratic National Convention. There's so many things in common. There's so much support that I think Guam could get out of Harris Walls um, administration. And those connections are, are wonderful. At the same time, I was also a Bush appointee when I was in the States. I was a Clinton appointee and I was a Bush appointee. And I have friends who I met in Iraq, who I worked very closely with, who worked on economic development programs, who are currently on the Trump transition team. And those are friends that I definitely would, and I'm talking to a couple of them right now on WhatsApp. And I'm maintaining that open line of communication because there are certainly things that I believe a Trump administration would be able to do for the people of Guam. And I think if you get too partisan in this environment, which is so polarized, it doesn't support the people of Guam. And I've got my eye solely focused on one thing, if I get sent to Washington, and that is doing the bidding and the work of the people of Guam not getting distracted, not getting into my own politics, not carrying the water for my political party in Washington over the interests of the people who elected me. Yeah. So that's yeah, my they, view. Because they say the currency of Congress is the vote, and we don't have one. So we don't. So you'd have to gotta f figure a way, a way to nav navigate around and that. And it's kind of a benefit and if you think yeah. about it nowadays, right? You can't <laughs> hold it against me. It wasn't like I had the deciding vote on that bill, which was like hardcore one yeah. party or the other. So... Okay, we've got 90 seconds left. I want you to look into the camera and, okay. and, and uh, present your closing arguments. Why should the people of Guam vote for you for Congress? I just want to thank everybody. This has been an incredible 
election campaign, and I've learned so much from everybody that I've met along the way and talked to, I can guarantee you that my heart and my whole being are into this issue. I have spent eight months thinking about and pondering and struggling with questions that we're all struggling with. How can we get Washington, D.C. to do more for the people of Guam? I've put down my initial thoughts in that platform because I want you to see it, to judge me, to send me comments. If you disagree, let me know. But at the end of the day, I hope that you've all been able to see how hard I will work for the people of Guam if you send me to Washington, D.C. Guam is my life. Guam is my home. I am a daughter of Guam, and I am going to be someone who fights so hard for our issues. You can count on that, and I promise if you send me to D.C., you're going to be proud of what we are all going to be able to do together. So I just ask you, please, go out and vote November 5th, and if you do, I would humbly ask you for one of those votes so that I can represent you in Washington. Thank you. Seeds Usmaasi and maraming salamat po. All right, Ginger Cruz, Democratic uh, candidate for Congress. I'm Nestor Lecanto. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Convos with the Candidates.